So this phase diagram that we understand a little bit better now, we call this a, a pressure composition phase diagram, just naming it after the axes. The vertical axis is pressure, the horizontal axis is the composition of a solution, either mole fraction in the liquid phase and or mole fraction in the vapor phase, depending on which of these two curves we're using. So as with any phase diagram, we can use it to tell what phase a system will occupy if we prepare it at a particular pressure and composition. It might be single phase or it might be uh, phase coexistence. We can also use it, for example, to read off, if I say prepare a solution at this composition, uh, under uh, what pressure um, will it first exhibit uh, vapor forming in the liquid or will it first exhibit liquid condensing out of the vapor. Likewise, we can say if I uh, form the first droplet, if I have a gas and I compress it until I form the first droplet, what will be the composition of that droplet? It will happen at this pressure and that droplet, which is a liquid, I could read over to this curve and read the liquid composition. So there's a lot of ways we can use this pressure composition phase diagram. But for now, I want to talk about a different axis, the temperature composition phase diagram. And that's because pressure is actually not the most convenient axis to use for a phase diagram. If I say com composition's fine, if I say prepare a solution that's 40%, 60% ethanol, methanol um, as a mole fraction, that's easy enough to do. But if I say, and make sure and do it under conditions where it generates a pressure above the liquid of uh, 70 tor, that's a little bit hard to, to engineer, hard to do. What's much easier if it, it would be if I were to say prepare that 60-40 solution but do it at a, at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Temperature is, is much easier to control than directly controlling the pressure of the system. So we need to think about how this diagram would look at um, temperature coordinates in addition to uh, pressure coordinates. And the, there's a connection, of course, between the pressure at which a liquid evaporates and becomes a gas or the temperature at which it uh, and the pressure at which it condenses. There's a connection between those pressures and the temperatures at which it would do the same thing. For example, when the pressure is equal to, and now I'll be thinking primarily about single component systems so I can write P star as a vapor pressure. If the, if the pressure is exactly equal to the vapor pressure, then I know I have equilibrium between two phases, the gas and the liquid phase. On the other hand, if the pressure is less than the vapor pressure, then the system will have evaporated and be in the gas phase. If the pressure is greater than the vapor pressure, then uh, I'll have liquid phase. If I want to make those same statements about temperature, I have liquid and gas coexisting in equilibrium whenever the temperature is equal to the boiling point, the vaporization temperature. I have a gas whenever the temperature is greater than the vaporization temperature. And I have a liquid whenever the temperature is lower than the boiling point or the vaporization temperature. So knowing what the boiling point is is equivalent in temperature terms to knowing what the, the vapor pressure is. But the signs of these two are different. Uh, a, a, a substance with a high vapor pressure is going to have a low boiling point and vice versa. A volatile liquid with a high vapor pressure is going to boil relatively easily at a low temperature. Luckily, we know something about the connection between the vapor pressure of a substance and its boiling point. And we know that from the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. If you remember the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, in one form that we've seen it, that says the log of P2 over P1 is equal to enthalpy of vaporization over R with a negative sign times the difference not of the boiling points but of 1 over the boiling points. So remember on a, on a phase diagram, a single component phase diagram, the temperatures and the pressures along the phase coexistence line between the liquid and the gas, uh, that, that line is described by this P1, P2, T1, T2 type of coordinates. This much detail is actually not necessary for us right now. All we need to know is that the log of the pressure is proportional to, and we don't much care about the, the exact magnitude of the proportionality, but the log of the pressure varies with 1 over the temperature. Um, so 
Um, and in fact, yeah, so the log of the temperature varies with 1 over the temperature. And again, that is confirming our, our statement that when the vapor pressure gets larger, the boiling point gets lower. More volatile uh, substances have lower boiling points. So that's enough, at least in principle, for us to say if I can draw a graph of P as a function of composition, I could plug, uh, I could transform those pressures and write them instead as temperatures rather than vapor pressures. So we won't do that mathematically. We won't, we won't do it quantitatively. We'll just make use of this qualitative observation that says as the vapor pressure goes up, the boiling point goes down. And so substances with a high vapor pressure have a lower boiling point. So when I redraw this diagram, uh, let me redraw it over here next to this one. If I redraw not a pressure composition di phase diagram, but a temperature composition phase diagram. Of these two solvents, A and B, I had written A with the higher vapor pressure, so I'll write A with a lower boiling point, so vaporization temperature of A. B has a lower vapor pressure, so I'll write it with a higher boiling point, temperature of vaporization of B. Again, these two endpoints are going to be connected by lines, connected by the bubble point and the dew point curves. On the pressure diagram, the bubble point curve where the liquid exists in, um, is in coexistence with the vapor at a particular liquid state composition is the upper of the two curves. Once I'm talking about temperature, again, because of this inverse relationship between pressure and temperature, the lower of the two curves, if there's two curves, the lower of the two curves is going to be the bubble point curve. In addition to that, it's no longer going to be a straight line. I'm not going to draw a straight line to connect the temperatures because this is not a linear relationship between pressure and temperature. So it, again, the exact mathematical form of the line isn't terribly important for us, but I'll just draw a somewhat curved line rather than a straight line. This will be our bubble point curve. And below this temperature, Below the temperature given by this bubble point coexistence curve will have liquid. Again, because when I cool a liquid or a solution below the temperature at which it vaporizes, given by this bubble point curve, I'm going to have a liquid. On the other side, what used to be the lower curve is now going to be the upper curve. It's going to be the dew point curve. It used to not be a straight line. I'm going to transform it by some function that is not a straight line. It doesn't magically undo the nonlinearness of this curve. I end up with still another nonlinear curve that ends up at the same endpoints. And this dew point curve is again going to be nonlinear, not a straight line. If I heat the substance to above the dew point curve, then I've got a pure single gas phase. Not pure, it's still a solution, but I have a single phase gaseous system. If I have a temperature and a composition that fall in between these two curves. Then I have phase coexistence. I have liquid coexisting with gas. If I want, if I have a system at this temperature, for example, it will be in equilibrium with a liquid at this composition and a gas at this composition. So just as on the pressure composition phase diagram, the temperature composition phase diagram has a liquid gas coexistence region. The horizontal lines in this phase coexistence region are tie lines that tell us the composition of the liquid, where the line encounters the liquid phase, composition of the gas, where the liquid encounters, uh, where the substance encounters the gas phase side of the phase diagram. So everything is basically the same for the temperature composition diagram as it is for the pressure di composition diagram, with the one exception that it's been turned upside down. There's an inverse relationship, a nonlinear inverse relationship between boiling points and vapor pressures. So uh, it's often more convenient to use this temperature composition phase diagram to understand at what point a liquid will begin to evaporate or a gas will begin to condense. In fact, we can draw some quick cartoons and illustrate how that would work, much as we did for the phase, uh, I'm sorry, the pressure composition phase diagram. If I have a mixture of liquid A and B, and the temperature is below, so if I start here at a temperature below the bubble point curve, I've got a, a pure liquid. 
if I heat that system up until I get to the bubble point curve, I, what will happen is what the, the name bubble point curve suggests will happen if I heat that system. So temperature is increasing until I get to this point. Let me go ahead and label these. This is diagram one. This is point one. When I get to the bubble point curve at this point two, diagram two, what will happen is uh, I will have formed my first, so I've got A and B in the liquid. I'll, I'll form my first droplet, my first bubble of vapor in this solution. Again, the composition of the vapor will be different than the composition of the liquid. I will, it will be enriched in the more volatile component, the one with the lower boiling point or the one with the higher vapor pressure. I can continue to increase the temperature further until I've boiled away much of the liquid and I have now a substantial amount of A and B in the gas phase. If I label that system number three, that may be at a point like this line, this horizontal line, where the liquid composition and the gas composition are now substantially different than they were in my initial system. The liquid system has been depleted substantially in that more volatile component because most, uh, much of it has evaporated into the vapor phase. The uh, vapor phase is more enriched in that volatile component A than the original system was because it evaporated out of the liquid more readily. Continuing even more to the point where now I've got a lot of A and B in, in the gas phase, only a little bit of liquid left. That would correspond to a point like this one this horizontal line, this tie line, where the vapor composition is now almost exactly the same as the initial composition of the system was. The liquid left behind is substantially depleted, uh, is about as depleted as we can make it in component A because it's the last little bit to evaporate, so it's um, largely component B. And if I continue to increase the temperature even more, I get to a point like this one where that would be purely in the vapor phase. All I've got is molecules of A and B in the vapor phase, no liquid left at all. And once I have passed that dew point curve, I can continue to increase the pressure and all that's gonna happen now. I won't change the composition anymore. I'll just heat the system further, expand it further uh, as, I, as I raise the temperature. So again, very similar to the process that happened as we uh, cross from one phase to another on the pressure composition diagram, we can use the tie lines to read the compositions in the same way. But now what we're talking about is boiling a system uh, rather, uh, as, as by changing its temperature rather than condensing or evaporating a system by changing its pressure.